Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for the, the invite to, to talk this evening. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about some of my ongoing research into the ways that religion in Roman Britain is presented in museums. And I'm particularly interested in concepts of lived religious experiences. Um, but before, that's working there. Before I start talking about religion specifically, I think it's important to recognise that the way that scholarship about the Roman world more generally, and Roman Britain as part of that world, has undergone significant changes in recent decades. I mean, it's a change that hasn't necessarily had a lot of impact outside of academia. So changes to how we think about religion and indeed how we might present it to museum visitors are intrinsically connected with how we think of the period more generally. So while we can recognise that reconstruction drawings like the, the one on screen here are clearly old fashioned, a lot of the underlying assumptions behind them still have enormous power. They still pervade how many people see the period. So we get these views rooted in effectively a centuries old dichotomy, one that you can say even goes back to the classical authors themselves, between two homogenized groups. We get Romans and we get native Britons. So in true Monty Python style, we, we can end up seeing the Romans as these sophisticated bringers of towns, roads, architecture, government, economics, art, culture, literacy, toga, baths, etc. And the native Britons conversely, being the, the semi-naked, spiky-haired, woad-painted, dirty, savage, mud-hut-dwelling, illiterate, tribal barbarians. Essentially, the Romans become the proactive and very mobile providers of civilization, with the native Britons the static and very passive receivers of that civilization. But challenging such simplistic views of the period isn't something that's just of obscure academic interest. The Roman world, of course, still exerts a huge influence on how particularly we in the West see ourselves, and it's even regularly brought to bear in modern political debate. And we still see these old tropes being continued, even by people with an expressed interest in the subject. And for example, the, the knock knock who's there meme at the top is one that circulated quite unironically on um, a discussion forum about the Roman world fairly recently. And the tweet at the bottom, which went viral um, towards the very end of, of last year, saying men will literally learn everything about ancient Rome instead of going to therapy, which I confess as a Romanist cut slightly, um, shows here this idea of studying the Roman world is almost becomes something to be ridiculed. It becomes linked with a fascination with imperialism and military conquest, the deeds of famous men, the you know, imperial biographies, all those old tropes come in. So how can we begin to chip away at some of these long-standing and deeply embedded preconceptions of Rome founded in a civilizing mission and to introduce some more contemporary post-colonial views that attempt to see such expansionist empires from different perspectives and starting to argue that life in Roman provinces was much more complicated than these overly, overly simplistic concepts of Romans and natives or of conquerors and conquered. <laughs> And so I think religion is quite an interesting lens through which to explore this. And indeed, the study of ancient religion has gone through similar revisions of thought in recent years. So rather than a religious landscape focused almost entirely on classical deities and temple based worship, we've got evidence of a much broader engagement with supernatural beliefs of deities of varying cultural backgrounds being moved around the empire by their worshippers, attracting new adherents and influencing the practice of other cults in the areas that they're brought to. We've got masses of evidence for structured deposition of the burial of objects, animals, and even infants placed as votive deposits under buildings in ditches or down wells to mark the beginning or the endings of their lives. We've got evidence of magical practices, the wearing of amulets for personal protection or the often extremely violent cursing of people who might have wronged you. And we can also begin to consider what it was like to experience these practices, what they meant socially, what it was like physically or emotionally to process around the ambulatory of a Romana Celtic temple like this one here on the left, while music was playing and the smells of incense, of blood, maybe even feces from the sacrificial animals wafted all around. To consider who was allowed to be there and what others might have thought of them for being there. To ask what networks were involved in obtaining the required sacrificial offerings and other ritual materials, and how any one individual ritual event had the potential to change and to influence how such events were conducted in the future. Essentially, to take Roman religion from something rather dry and focused on the correct performance of ritual acts to something lived and experienced by people and that had a real impact in their daily lives and relationships. And as major places for people to engage with the archaeology of Roman Britain, I'm interested in how museums are or could at least begin to consider such issues. <laughs> 
So to start to look into all this, I've been analysing a number of museums across the country, um, divided into two groups. You can see there a northern and a southern group. Well, I have to confess, COVID has slightly impacted on my ability over the last year to get out and survey museums, but that's the hand we're dealt and we have to get on with it. So uh, a northern and a southern group it is. The, the, the figure here is actually from the Verulamium Museum, which rather cheekily put a little COVID mask on their figurine of, of Venus on display, which is quite cute. Um, but um, it's the northern group of museums I'm going to be focusing on um, today, and many of the museums in that group you will hopefully be, be uh, quite familiar with. So as David says, yeah, my professional background is in archaeological museum curatorship. And that's kind of one thing I'm keen to get across is that I, I know how museums work and I know the constraints that curators work under now more than ever. And so for me, this isn't about kind of nitpicking individual displays or saying what any individual museum could have done if they had a, a 10,000 word essay to put on the wall next to every object or hundreds of thousands of pounds of virtual reality budgets to play with. Although. I do obviously have to critique individual displays to, to make my points and, and my arguments. But for me, it's more it's more overarching than that. It's more fundamentally about how we approach the subject from the very roots and the ground and the planning stage up. It's not about making displays more complex or making them more academic, but hopefully on the contrary, making them more engaging and more relatable for visitors while simultaneously better reflecting some of the current thinking about the period. It's about getting people to challenge their preconceptions about what religion was and more generally what Roman Britain was. So my analyses, and I'm going to stress this is still all you know, a work in progress at the moment, um, is looking at four main strands that you can see here. So the first spatial analysis, how religious material has been integrated into displays of Romano-British archaeology, concepts of Romans and natives and this religious hybridity and practice in the province, lived religion and experiential archaeologies, and museum interpretation, language and reconstruction. Now, I'm only really going to focus on the first two this evening, just for issues of, of time. You can breathe a slight sigh of relief. Um, but I'm just going to say something very briefly about lived religion and experiential archaeologies first. They're, they're the, the underpinning for a lot of the, the approach that I'm taking. Now, I don't really want to get bogged down in, in theory this evening. You'll be pleased to know we'll be getting onto the, the pictures of museums and things very soon. Um, but just to explain some of these, the, the first thing I'm, I'm using as an underpinning is this concept of lived ancient religion. Now, that name is specifically relating to a project that ran at the University of Erfurt in Germany between 2012 and 2017. Um, and there are various successor projects still ongoing, but it takes its idea from a very contemporary anthropological religious approach called lived religion, which is the idea that if you start studying religious groups and religious beliefs and individuals from the perspective of the individual, from a bottom up approach, rather than from the perspective of churches and religious organizations, you get a very different very different picture of how religion works. You see a lot more individual choice, people picking and choosing aspects of their faith, even from different faiths, a lot of spirituality perhaps coming in that doesn't really belong to any of the, the monotheistic dogmas. Um, we, see, we see a lot of individuality. So it's taking those sorts of approaches and applying them to the ancient world. Now, the Lived Ancient Religion Project was specifically looking at the Mediterranean, but some of these principles are starting to spread into archaeological studies in the Roman provinces, including Roman Britain. Um, I'm particularly interested in how they can be used to talk to the public and actually engage the public in ideas of religion, which is some way that uh, I think and certainly hope it hasn't, hasn't yet been, been used in. So some of these ideas, yeah, as I say, the perspective of the individual and religious choice, as I've just mentioned, this idea of religion is always in the making um the idea that religion is dynamic and religious groups and even religious individuals are constantly having to renegotiate their position to maintain their influence or to attract new members as, as new religious ideas arise ritual acts don't perform themselves they need to be performed by people to be maintained um, and people need evidence that they're efficacious and worth performing and therefore every re individual religious act has the potential to change the way that act is performed in future. So that idea of everything being one of creative or potential creative performance. And that links into the final point there, this idea of the negotiation of social and religious authority, that religious groups and worshippers don't exist in their own bubble in the ancient world any more than they do today. They're intrinsically enmeshed within social networks, economic networks, political networks. And we need to consider how religious groups um, are working within their wider context to understand really how they operate. The other side of the, uh, the, the screen here is experiential archaeologies. 
And this is something I'm using as an umbrella term to describe a number of complementary approaches uh, within archaeology to material culture. So um, multisensory um, archaeologies and indeed increasingly multisensory museologies, although that's not as easy to say, um, as you might imagine, these are about going beyond the visual. So, for example, going beyond religious iconography to consider taste, smell, sound um, in our considerations of religious spaces and objects. But this can also include emotional engagement, uh, memory, and often overlooked senses such as proprioception, which is the awareness of the position and movement of the body. You know, so how that might work in relation to religious gestures or religious processions and, and movement. Embodied interactions with material culture. Um, embodiment is about how we engage physically with material culture, how we wear things, how we hold them, and how such things influence us and those around us. And, and I'll give a couple of specifically religious examples of embodiment in, in just a moment. And then finally here, materiality and the, the, the so-called ontological term. Um, sounds complex, it's not as complex as, as it sounds, as all good theory is. Um, this is about recognising that our own relationships with materials and with the wider natural world are cultural. They're not universal to all of humanity. So it's about challenging our own preconceptions about how we perceive the world around us. It's an approach that promotes seeing the natural world and the materials that objects are made from as effectively equal partners with humans, not subservient to humans. So the idea that materials influence us as much as we shape them and when we're looking at beliefs in the supernatural, recognising different ontologies is particularly important. So to move just to those, those few examples of embodiment that I mentioned, um, this is a, a rather wonderful jug uh, from Carlisle on display currently, well, currently behind locked doors, but currently um, on display at Tully House Museum on long term loan from the British Museum. And as you can see, it has these fantastic ritual scenes uh, running up the handle, these various phases of, of a, an ongoing ritual sacrificial act. It's also, as you can hopefully see, um, also has this lovely evidence of use wear, which increases as you head up towards the rim. Now, this is wear created by the repeating, repeated handling and pouring of the jug over many different occasions. And so what we have is scenes of ritual activity being worn away during the performance of likely those self same ritual activities. The jug itself is evidence of the long term repetition of a number of individually significant ritual events. And we can maybe start to engage with how the user or more likely multiple users over time might have felt while carrying out those actions, touching those increasingly worn depictions and being aware that their actions were continuing to physically change the jug and to add to that collective memory of repeated ritual activity. Another example of embodiment is the wearing of amulets, um, such as this jet gorgon pendant on the left and the copper alloy phallic pendant on the right. Both are magical amulets worn on the body to protect against malevolent misfortune. To start with the, the pendant first, the iconography on the pendant is of the, the Medusa. That's why it's a, a gorgon pendant. So we can see that its, its magical protective power, its apotropaic power is partially derived from that imagery, from that iconography, you know, that the Medusa turning people to stone is a clear symbol of warding off any anything or anybody that might wish you um, ill intent and harm. But the material is also important here and most likely very deliberately chosen. Jet um, emits an electrostatic charge, a mild electrostatic charge when rubbed. And many of these pendants that we find um, are rubbed quite smooth. They're worn very smooth as if somebody has actually been rubbing them um, while they've been using and wearing them. And perhaps that haptic feedback from the electrostatic charge was evidence to the person wearing it that the amulet was working. It was something that as they were going around, perhaps in a, a, a stressful or worrying situation, that embodied engagement with the amulet actually told them that it was offering them the protection they needed. So you can see it's not just a, a thing that hangs around somebody's neck. It's something that influences the way somebody might engage with the, the world around them as they go about their daily business. Similarly, with the, the phallic pendant, um, phallic imagery is, is quite common right across the Roman world. We find it on everything from you know, carved onto the sides of buildings to you know, small amulets like these. And the Hadrian's Wall area, as you may well know, has, has masses and masses of examples. In terms of pendants, we find them very often in bone and copper alloy, also in, in gold. Um, but they also come in different forms. Some hang across the body, against the body quite flat. Others like this, if you can imagine how this would have been suspended around the neck from that suspension loop, you can see that it would have projected outwards from the body um, very prominently, almost aggressively, you might say. 
and that again is a a deliberate part of the the functionality of the pendant there's been some interesting work in recent years an american scholar Alyssa whitmore published a paper um what three nearly four years ago now um that feels more recent than that um where she got hold of a replica of one of these pendants coerced a friend of hers who you can see here on screen to, to wear it and she measured and recorded the movement of the pendant while he carried out um, various activities while he was sat while he was reading talking walking jogging and she recorded that this pendant was almost constantly in motion whatever he was doing it was active it was moving it was like it was reacting to the environment and the situation but it virtually always returned to that aggressive projecting state so again we can perhaps start to perceive that somebody might have seen that sort of movement and, and that positioning as evidence of the efficacy of the of the amulet it's working to protect you it's not just hanging lifelessly around your neck and there's this kind of linked idea of visibility um it's been argued that a lot of phallic imagery had to be seen to be effective so are these pendants something that somebody would have worn in a way that could be seen by other people or would it be something that was maybe hidden under clothes that only you you know, knew about and were, and were aware of you know, how does this interact with other people that you might have passed in the street and how they might have perceived you as somebody choosing or needing to wear something like this again this is the the social interactions that these very outward shows of small-scale religious belief and magical belief um, lead to and one of the problems we have with museum displays is that all of these different aspects are very easily lost when an object like these are just kind of laying static and for want of a better word lifeless on, on a museum display shelf and an important uh, aspect um, of my approach and my study is that objects in museums aren't simply evidence of religious activity or belief they're not just things to be looked at to discern what humans believed or what they did they're a fundamental element of the network of people and things that come together to form religion um, people places material culture customs traditions that might otherwise and independently be quite prosaic but they become ritual when they're combined in specific ways and so objects like these displayed in museums can be seen not just as merely religious they're a fundamental element of religion itself so let's turn to have a look at the the integration of, of religion into museum displays more of the spatial analysis aspect of what i'm looking at this is one of the uh, the schematic plans that i'm doing for all of the museums i'm surveying across the country uh, you can see there this is the the hadrian's wall gallery at the great north museum um, if i've done a half decent job on the plan you may even recognize it without the title hopefully so um, i'm not going to go into to detail about the, the the wacky color schemes that i'm putting on these which indicate different types of displays and interactives and various things um, the, the key thing here is anything any display that has um, romano british material in it is red and any display that has at least one romano british religious object is in purple and from this you can see from the amount of purple across the gallery uh, that religious material features very very heavily um, and in fact the great north museum has i think a greater percentage of religious objects on display than any museum i'm, I'm surveying only the british museum um, comes close they have an, an awful lot of religious material as well but including a lot of religious objects and explaining religion aren't necessarily the same thing and one thing I'm interested in is how well religion is being more generally integrated into various displays of Roman Britain, and particularly whether it's being kept very much in its box. Although there are religious objects on display across the gallery, that doesn't mean that they're being interpreted as religious objects. For example, instead being used as examples of literacy or as examples of jewellery or simply as artworks. So this graph is something that I've been working up, um, still very much a work in progress. Uh, this this covers the the northern group of museums that you saw on that, that map earlier and this is working with what i'm terming display units which are um, discrete groupings of objects and interpretation within museum displays so a single display unit could be anything from a single object to a shelf or a plinth in a display case to a whole display case to maybe an entire wall of stonework or wall plaster or wall mounted objects uh, as long as they form a discrete unit um, and looking at how these things are being grouped and how religion is being integrated or not into various aspects of what we might term life in roman britain so each of these columns represents one of the 17 categories i've created and allocated each display unit to so this is quite subjective work um, but you can see that perhaps unsurprisingly uh, for the northern museums military is the most common 
um, display unit I've encountered. Um, that in itself perhaps demonstrates quite just how bound up displays are in some of these traditional tropes of the of the Roman world, but I, I won't go back into that now. Um, religion is the second most common category, closely followed by buildings and then this more generic sense of daily life. So this is clearly showing that religion is a major aspect of displays, but it does perhaps also show that it's being displayed for the most part as a thing in its own right, uh, detached from the rest of life. Now, a key aspect of this graph is that these light and dark blue segments that you can hopefully see from the key represent respectively minor and more significant references to religious um, beliefs and activity in those categories. And what we can see is that, well, of course, unsurprisingly, all of the religion category talks about religious beliefs. It's not that well integrated into many of the other categories. Stonework, um, just at the left of the center of the graph, is um, perhaps an interesting booking of the trend, although stonework here represents very miscellaneous displays of stonework. If any groupings of any display units of stonework could be categorized into one of those other categories, then they were. So this is very much stonework displayed as you know, random examples of stonework across all kinds of different categories. And even then, half of the references are still very minor references to stonework. And I think it's perhaps more reflecting just how much religious stonework survives um, in the north of England, um, rather than it being necessarily well integrated. I think when I do this study for the Southern Museums, the, the greater, so that's well, so that the far fewer examples of religious stonework will, will start to, to, you know, to balance that out. Some categories, such as um, military, buildings, daily life, trade and commerce, industry and production, and perhaps most surprisingly, death and burial, seem to very rarely engage with any of the ritual activity surrounding those areas of life at all. And I think a reason for that is perhaps most likely related to the way that museum displays are traditionally formed. They're formed around the interpretation of individual objects chosen for their aesthetic qualities. So another thing I'm looking at with regard to this graph, and it's not reflected in this graph to try and keep it vaguely um, understandable, but is what these references to religion actually say about it. Do they talk, for example, about iconography? Do they talk about the context of the, the object's discovery or the context of its use? And what I found is that over 60% of all of these references to religion, whether minor or significant, are iconographic. Their labels describing what objects look like or what designs or writing they have on them, rather than how, where, when, or why they were actually being used. It's an aesthetic approach to museum display uh, that's focusing on describing groups of collected objects, rather than using those objects to discuss more holistic issues of religion and how it worked. So just to give an example of what I, I mean by these iconographic labels, um, see the, the picture on the left here, the, the rather nice sculpture of Minerva from uh, the Senhouse Museum in Maryport with the simple label, Relief of Minerva, Goddess of Wisdom. And from the National Museum of Scotland on the right, a, a group of objects relating to Mercury, which is part of what I'm turning the, the catalogue of gods approach, this idea of the, you know, the, here's the list of gods you could choose from if you were a worshipper in, in Roman Britain. So yeah, Mercury grouped together with a very simple description of what the object is, what the deity is holding, what the attributes are, what the animal attendants are, but going no deeper into actually what any of this means, you know, or, or how or why or where it would have been used. And you may be familiar with this sort of approach from museums across the country. It's not an uncommon level of interpretation to find. But I don't want to be entirely negative here, um, because hidden within those overarching statistics are some really interesting examples of the integration of religion. And here at the, the Corbridge Site Museum, for example, the display on kind of more general health and well-being, caring for the body and soul, has really well integrated concepts of both physical and spiritual well-being, combining the idea of practical medicine with prayer, spiritual healing, the wearing of amulets. And that's a really good example of how religion can be very well integrated into these aspects of daily life and in a way that modern visitors can relate to and actually you know, bring their own experiences to bear on how the sense of, of health and well-being is not purely a physical thing. So there are some really interesting examples starting to come out and I think an interesting direction of travel that we can take when displaying this sort of material. Now one of the problems facing museums can be the historic formation of collections. Um, along Hadrian's Wall, for example, material has ended up in, in very different collections and this influences how individual sites can be approached and interpreted at any one individual museum. So the Mithraeum at Housteads Fort, for example, features in this display at the Great North Museum, 
Uh, the statue of Cautes here, which actually is just called Rind, um, isn't actually from Housesteads. It's actually from the Mithraeum at Carabruff. And it's likely been placed here in this display to maintain this lovely sense of symmetry on display. Now you can see, you know, with the altars and all the figurative work displayed very symmetrically and, and very nicely. Um, and, but I'm going to return in a moment to this idea of symmetry and display aesthetics. That statue was also likely there, though, um, because other statuary from the Housesteads Mithraeum is on display at the um, Clayton Museum at Chester's Roman Fort. You can see here Cautes and Cautipates, these companions of, of Mithras, and they're displayed in the very Victorian mass stonework style that the Clayton Museum um, has. The museum actually at Housesteads as a site itself has got no stonework from the Mithraeum on display, but it's the only one of the three to actually have a reconstruction drawing of the interior of the Mithraeum, and you might recognise some of the stonework in the displays in that reconstruction drawing. But the problem is that none of those three displays references um, any of the others, and there's no single site that any visitor can really get a more complete representation of that Mithraeum, of its setting, and of the worship that took place within it. It's, it's disparate, it's, it's a, a disjointed approach to, a, you know, to interpreting an individual site. Now, because stonework, as I said, is a big element of the religious material culture in Northern Britain. And I think the relative positioning of it in museums is quite an interesting thing. Um, one thing we've got to consider, of course, with stonework is that it's quite difficult to display. It's big, it's heavy, it often even needs specialist floor loading to be considered. Um, and it can be expensive and even risky for both the objects and, and the people to move it around. It's also, as Romana British archaeology is generally quite small in nature, very, very visible. Um, and this does lead it to often becoming a category in its own right with altars, other religious reliefs, tombstones, centurial stones from the wall, etc., being grouped together because of their material rather than their original function and, and their original context. Um, the altars that we can see on screen at the minute are from the, the shop and foyer area at Tully House in Carlisle. Um, I've been dubbing them the toilet altars as they are here placed outside the, the visitor toilets. Um, there's no interpretation of them at all. The bits you can see above aren't interpretation. And I think they're, they're clearly there as an attempt to get displays out of the galleries into public spaces uh, you know, to entice visitors to go beyond the paywall. Um, and stonework is usually robust enough to be used in this sort of way. But I think it's interesting to, to consider what the original dedicators might think of their very valuable and, and pious religious offerings and, and their positioning now. Um, but slight flippancy aside, the original positioning of altars was something of significance. It wasn't something that was done haphazardly. They were central to acts of sacrifice. They were often positioned so that the dedicator could see the idol of the deity that they were beseeching. They were monuments intended not only to last, but also to remind future dedicators of the status, the generosity, the piety of that original dedicator, and to perhaps encourage them to make similar donations of their own, something the temple would no doubt have encouraged for their own benefit. So they have this, again, social and economic aspect to them, as well as the religious, um, as, as they have this ongoing effect down potentially multiple generations. And so if we take this display, for example, of the altars from the Temple of Jupiter Dolicanus at uh, Vindolanda. You can see the two main altars from the site placed symmetrically on either side of the display with a smaller altar placed slightly back um, on the wall to the right and behind. None of them are particularly easily legible, I think it has to be said, and they're all placed to suit the aesthetics of the available display space. Now, of course, with site museums like Vendelanda, there's a distinct advantage over a lot of other museums in that the original context is still visible out on site. And indeed, at Vendelanda, we do have these rather lovely replicas positioned at the places where the altars were discovered. And I think from this, though, we can instantly see that the spatial relationships between the altars and the temple architecture are significant. The smaller altar that was on the wall, slightly pushed to the back in the museum display, suddenly stands out as being placed very differently from the other two. It's outside the door of the temple. It's clearly much more diminutive in size. It was actually dedicated by a female devotee called Alexandria. And it's therefore a very interesting example of the relative status of female worshippers and even their ability to make offerings to what was a very male and very military deity at a temple positioned inside the walls of a Roman fort. Now, the museum labelling does mention some of these elements, but only briefly, 
but the positioning of the altars in the museum space removes this immediate and very obvious impact of their positioning that we get when we see them here in context. And obviously we have the site remains here. People can go out and see them on site, but how much harder is it when the museum isn't attached to such wonderful and evocative remains on site? And this is a site again that you might recognize. This is the Mithraeum at uh, Caribroth. So you know, on a lovely sunny day, looking forward to getting back here at some point again in the hopefully near future. And you can see that there are replicas of the altars uh, positioned in situ at the far end. And here are the original um, altars still in situ during their excavation in the early 1950s. Just to go back to the, the replicas again, you can see sort of mimic the positioning of the, of the originals. And you'll see that there's a symmetry to them. Um, although the one on the left has the relief of soul and the other, the other two are um, epigraphic in nature, and they're all of slightly different heights. If you notice that the central altar there has a focus, this stone bowl in the center between two balusters, which is for the lighting of a fire, the pouring of offerings. Um, yeah, that's the center of the, the religious interactivity with the altar. Whereas the two to either side have flat stone tops. Now they may have had separately carved pieces of stone to sit on top, or they might otherwise be what are known as mensai, religious tables effectively. Um, so they may have had statuary, they may have had braziers, portable foci, maybe even a place where offerings or other ritual paraphernalia was placed on them as part of religious ceremonies. But if we compare the replicas on site to the originals as they're now displayed in the Great North Museum, you can see that their order has been changed. The figurative altar has been brought into the centre. And as we saw earlier with the Housestead's Mithraeum display and, and Vindolanda, I think we have to ascribe that to the dominance of museum display aesthetics. Our own sense of visual balance and what order these things should be in has overridden, we might even say destroyed, the original religious spatial relationships that the altars possessed. It's not intentional, but it does represent a disconnect between, between the very deliberate original intent of the worshippers and the functionality of the altars as a group and museum design and interpretation processes. There's another factor here though as well, which is although the altars possess the original symmetry, they weren't actually created at the same time. They represent altars dedicated by members of the cult at different times during its life, but then brought together in the fourth century. So they represent this communal memory of ritual activity spanning generations and even spanning different rebuildings of the Mithraeum as a building. In addition, beneath the altars was found a ritual deposit, a deliberate pit beneath the packing material placed to support the altars and containing a ceramic beaker, two pieces of pine cone, which was a, a fuel used on the altars, a small tin cup and some chicken bones, obviously a, a, a ritual feast or a, a ritual sacrifice of a chicken. Now this was created at the time the altars were placed into their what turned out to be final position but it would also have been something that those later worshippers at the Mithraeum would have been aware of, despite it being out of sight. So the altars therefore only formed one part of an accumulation of both visible and invisible ritual activity, but something that was ever present and was connecting generations of worshippers. Now, the beaker is on display on, in the gallery. If I hopefully you can see my mouse cursor coming up on screen, there's actually the, the beaker in that foundation pit. And here's that same beaker in one of the display cases in the museum. Um, so it's there, but it's disconnected both physically and interpretationally from the altars. And, and as we've seen before, the large stone altars are kind of made to form a detached display group on their own that they kind of stand independently of other ritual activity at the site rather than as part of this cumulative effect of, of combined ritual activity. So to turn to the other aspect that I'm, I'm focusing on this evening, which is more about the people themselves and how museums are looking at more overarching concepts of religion, religious practices and, and religious worshippers. One consistent theme that I'm encountering across the interpretation at many of the museums nationally in my survey is this idea of, of tolerance. Uh, museums either using the word directly or implying it in their labels. And this is the idea that, as you can hopefully see from some of the images of, of text panels that are on screen at the moment, which I, I won't read out, but hopefully that they're legible on whatever size screen you're using. Um, it's this idea that the Romans tolerated the other religions they came into contact with and permitted native worship to continue, or the linked idea that local deities joined the classical pantheon rather than the other way around. Essentially, the entire process is seen from a Roman perspective. <clears throat> 
And so this is quite an interesting lens through which to look at some of the issues I raised right at the outset. This is an example of that traditional dichotomy between this homogenous mass of incomers called Romans on the one side and an equally homogenous mass of natives on the other. The first group is the one calling all the shots and the second group just have to accept it. But it's not really how post-colonial models of the creation of hybrid cultures and the movement and blending of religious ideas works. The Romans here are actually represented by a range of individuals of very differing cultural backgrounds, many of them having themselves only become part of the Roman world in the very recent past. Now, this isn't to say there wasn't a power imbalance in the Roman world and that local communities couldn't be faced with threats of violence in certain circumstances or even the repression of their traditional ritual act. But I think we should be more nuanced in the way we consider these issues and consider them as individual case studies rather than as a blanket provincial wide perspective. So an interesting example of this is the so-called mother goddesses, which are found across Roman Britain, as you can see from some of the examples here. Because they're not part of the, the classical pantheon, they're described, not entirely incorrectly, as Celtic deities, although to the word Celtic has its own problems. Um, but the trouble is that this also leads to them being either directly or indirectly also seen as native deities, continuing this, this dichotomy. The problem is we've got no evidence of them in Britain prior to the Roman invasion. They too are just as much a Roman import as Jupiter or Mars, just one that's come from Gaul and Germany and brought in by soldiers, officials, merchants, etc. from those areas. And one issue that we have when we're presenting religion is that the classical world does just exert so much of an enormous influence. And um, this graph this is the last graph I'll be, I'll be showing um, is from an online survey that I did um, of people working with or expressing a strong interest in heritage and archaeology and they were presented with a list of 30 deities all of which are attested in roman britain uh, they were presented in alphabetical order without any any categories attached and people were asked to tick which ones they recognized and you can see that the classical deities in red um uns quite unsurprisingly dominate the the recognition now although some of the classical deities are clearly more widely attested and some of the native deities are very very localized it does still show how deities from the classical pantheon and, and, and in green the mystery cults that spread across the Roman world from the Eastern Mediterranean, such as Mithras, um, continue to dominate people's perceptions of religion in Roman Britain. And I think this pattern would be undoubtedly even more exaggerated if the, the sample of respondents was from the wider public, not people with, with a especially a specialist knowledge and interest um, in archaeology. And so there's clearly an element of a balance that needs to be redressed about some of these more holistic religious landscapes of Roman Britain. Part of the issue is perhaps, as I say, the, the classical ideals that we ascribe to the period. Uh, this stone head, for example, is at the Durham Archaeology Museum. It's had a, a replica very nicely repainted to demonstrate ancient polychromy, uh, which is in itself a very important issue in challenging perceptions of the whiteness of the classical world. But there is still a problem here. The eyes of the original sculpture on the left, you can hopefully see, are clearly the large lentoid eyes characteristic of native depictions of the human head. But in the reconstruction, in the painted reconstruction, that's been completely overlooked in favour of classical proportions and these small, realistically scaled eyes expectations of classical standards have completely overridden the very physical evidence of a more complex reality and of the, the blending and mixing of traditions. And so this brings us back again to the idea of Romans and natives and of who's worshipping what deities and some of the hierarchies that we place on the deities we find attested in Roman Britain. So this is an example of one of the character panels you can see here on the right at the Great North Museum. Um, and I personally, I, I love these. Um, these use creative first person text to put words into the mouth of the person in the past. And I think there's a, a real advantage in using these because I think they enable us to raise questions and challenge the way visitors think about things in a way that some of the traditional curatorial voice labels don't do. Um, this one relates to a chap called Tineus Longus and his dedications to a god called Antenicitus, who you may well be aware of, uh, to whom a temple existed at Benwell. Now, there are numerous examples of Roman military personnel dedicating offerings to various local native deities. And here we have an example of a high status Roman officer setting up an altar to Antenicitus in thanks following an important promotion. Now, Longus clearly didn't think that the powers of Antenicitus were restricted to minor or merely local affairs. But the interpretation expresses constant surprise that he doesn't. He's only a local deity, it says. <laughs> 
it just goes to show that these local gods are more powerful than you think. But this actually seems more like the surprise of the person writing the text than of Longus himself, who clearly saw his original vow as something well within the deity's power to provide. This seems to be applying perceptions of the relative abilities and influence of deities based on our own hierarchies and biases of their cultural and geographical origins, rather than something that existed in, in the north of Rome and Britain. So instead of asking why a local god was being worshipped rather than a classical one, I think we should perhaps be asking why this god specifically? How did the soldiers at the fort engage with local populations to become aware of the existence of Antonicaticus? How were they convinced of the efficacy of worshipping him? How did they know his name if indeed they didn't make it up themselves? And what images or symbols of him existed? How were the erection of the stone temple, the creation of the anthropomorphic images of him, the use of Roman forms of the vow and the construction of altars received by other people locally? Did the successful offerings of someone of Longus's status affect the popularity or the status of the cult? I think these are some of the more interesting questions um, of how religious ideas clash and conflate that we should be presenting to museum visitors. And so I just want to stay with Antenna Kittikus to, uh, to bring things to a close, because, of course, the Great North Museum has, as part of that very same display, this rather fantastic carved stone head of that deity found at the temple at Benwell, and almost certainly the head of the idol, the central image of the temple. Now, the temple at Benwell wasn't just an architectural structure where you could go to worship Antenna Kittikus. Like any temple at the time, we can assume that it was perceived as being the god's very literal home. The Latin word for temple, ides, after all, just means house. The idol at the centre of the temple wasn't just an artistic depiction of the deity. We've reason to believe it was perceived as actually being that deity. Perhaps it was painted, perhaps it was draped in clothes or garlands of flowers, perhaps perfumed with incense. For somebody like Longus to look into the face of most likely this very same image while making his vow was to be looking into the eyes of that deity, and just as importantly, to be being seen by that deity in return. It was likely an emotional response, an experience, and one that wasn't undertaken by him lightly. And in some ways, I think that's the essence of what I hope we might be able to move towards, an exploration of religion in Roman Britain that encompasses the emotion of belief, not just religious iconography. As I said earlier, the objects we display in museums aren't merely religious, they are religion. And I hope we can encourage visitors to look into the face of a stone carving such as this and to try and imagine more of the lived cultural and religious experiences that affected the daily lives of people in the province to challenge their preconceptions of what it was like to experience religion in Roman Britain. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll stop screen sharing at that point. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we, we can't we can't do a, a round of applause. We can kind of mime, uh, and there's probably a way of doing a Mexican wave on Zoom. But I think it'd be far too complicated to, to try and that <laughs> right now. Thank you, thank you very much for that. That was, that was I really really enjoyed that. As obviously, as a lot of you know, my my own research is centred around understanding religion, and I think you know, one of the key things Anthony's really brought out is how messy and vibrant and exuberant religious life would have been in the past um, whether you're looking at early christianity or whether you're looking at the roman world it's a world where smells and noises and color uh, and all these things were were there the temples would have been cluttered with all sorts of offerings there would have been wine and blood and feathers and and, <laughs> and just chanting and singing all sorts of things going on there would have been processions it would have been for a, a any, anybody's ever been somewhere like India and experienced the, the kind of the sheer diversity of religious practice over there will we'll have a sense perhaps of how very different Roman religion is to how we often perceive it uh, today. And I, I think you know, one of the things that really struck me is both the, the strong case he made there for that, that the sheer just kind of vitality of, of Roman religious tradition, the sheer difficulty in distinguishing between what is Roman, what is native, uh, and really whether those two particular categories really mean much by the time you get really any, any, any depth into the, into the Roman period. Um, and also, also you know, how the very practical issue of how do we talk about this in in museums? So that some of us who some of you who who logged on uh, earlier might, might have heard us chatting beforehand about about the difficulty of explaining to people how you know, in, in in a world which is increasingly secular, uh, people just not understanding or having experienced themselves 
a, a range of, of, of religious worship and, and religious practice. So I think there's been really, really interesting ideas have, have come up there. So what I'm going to do is, I've, I've, if you've got questions, if you could put them into chat, and I'm going to go through uh, the questions. It's purely going to be uh, in the order in which they come. come uh, and we'll, if Anthony's OK, we'll, we'll, we'll throw some questions at him. Yeah, definitely. And we'll, 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 see, we'll see which ones stick. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, so um, got a, a question from Emma about about Clayton. Uh, that, that's the, uh, the the museum up at Chester's where you showed some of some of the uh, uh, the Mithraic imagery, saying how it's very cluttered and difficult to access. Um, yeah. And it's part and it's partly because it's it's it, it it's a uh, it's a museum of a museum in many senses, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I I have a, a love hate relationship with Clayton Museum as I don't know maybe other people do, and it seems a bit Emma may have as well, but. I love it on the one hand. I love the feeling that it evokes. I love the view of the mass stonework. I love the fact that every time you can go in it, you can find something new. Um, but equally, there is some really incredibly important items in there that have come from other sites and are perhaps just not able to get the, you know, the context and the the significance and, and yeah that, that, that they perhaps deserve. Um, and obviously, I mentioned the, the bits from the Housesteads Mithraeum, but you know, there's really important altars from the commander's house at uh, Vindolanda that are, that are in there with you know unique iconography and, and references on them so there's a lot of detail lost in that mass stonework display that I do find a bit frustrating um, one thing I didn't get a chance to mention in this which is really interesting about the Clayton Museum is they've actually got a, a, a nice digital thing of um, it's basically a, like a, a votive interactive as you go in where you take a little votive lamp I don't know if people have seen this you you take one of the votive lamps and you have the goddess Juno who who has a, a wonderful Geordie accent when she does it it's beautiful um, telling you basically you know to go around the museum and choose the deities you want to offer to and it's, it's a great piece of tech I think it's actually really talking about embodiment when you're walking around with this little Basically, a wooden modern lamp with three lights in it. Every time you choose an altar you want to, you know, deity you want to dedicate against, you put it up to the interpretation panel, and one of your lights goes out in your altar, and it really makes it a moment of tension. You know, I've only got three of these. Yeah, you know, which am I going to do? So that thing in your hand becomes really significant. So that I think is a really nice bit of tech and a really nice way to engage with what could be quite imposing displays. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, I, I do wonder how, and, and you know, it's, it's nothing as much of a secret. I mean, Francis McIntosh, who many of you may well know, you know, who curates the collections up there, has, has said that there's, there is a bit of a problem that visitors do often walk into that museum, do one very quick lap and walk out again. You know, there's not a lot of dwell time in there and it is very off-putting that those walls of stonework. So, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a love and hate for me. <laughs> Great. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to bring in the next two, two, next two questions together from, from Liz and, and Karen, asking about basically about, about the, the, the local, the local deities. Um, mm. Are there? I mean, could you say a little bit something about these very, say a little something about these very, very localized deities, which we only have. I, mean, I, I think one of the strong points you made is that we don't have, we don't have mention of a lot of these gods before the Romans get here, and it's very easy to kind of back project them. In, into the Iron Age past, but I mean, how how many do we have? Do yes. we have a lot of these on Hadrian's Wall? Is is it something particularly fine on the military frontier? I don't know if it's so much just the military front. I mean, you do get a lot on the military frontier, and there are a lot on Hadrian's Wall. But then, I, I think there's a, there's a thing that because Hadrian's Wall is so well studied and so well recorded, I think we know of a lot more of them. That when you go to other museums around the country and the more civilian areas, there's still plenty of just random altars to Genius Loki just found in various bits and you know, found next to a stream or found next to a road in a patch of woodland. So I, th I think it's quite a widespread thing. But yeah, how that actually works, who's giving these deities, obviously if it's Genius Loki, then it's an interesting idea that perhaps yeah, nobody is there to tell somebody the name or the person doesn't want to make a name up. But yeah, when we get to things like Antenna Kitticus, is this a pre-existing named deity or is this something that the Roman military are applying their own names to. Um, the idea of the, the any, any predecessor deities being more animistic in nature is a really interesting thing. There's been some, um, there's a book literally just out the very end of last year, very start of this year, um, by um, a scholar, Philip Keane in, in America, who's looking at idols and, and he's very much challenging this preconception that we don't have 
anthropomorphic depictions of deities in the Iron Age. You know, he's looking particularly at, at Germany and Gaul, but he's basically saying, no, that you know, we need to blast that idea out of the, the water. The Romans aren't the ones introducing the idea of a, an anthropomorphic human image of these deities. The chances are it's just in organic materials. You know, whenever we find it, it's organic and perhaps these things are just not surviving. So, you know, maybe there is a wooden coventina at some point that we you know, that just hasn't survived for us to find. And there is a well-established shrine there beforehand but yeah it's so difficult <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring together a, a, another kind of couple of questions one one from Lorraine uh, and, and one from Robert about about the challenge of of interpreting this material um I mean, I mean Lorraine's asking about how 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 do you it's really a question about how do you how do you manage the the, the balance between a some visitors who will know a lot some visitors who will know very very little some visitors will be ch children some visitors will be you know might 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 be kind of foreign tourists how how do we try and convey some of the really quite complex stuff you're talking about so again robert robert's asking about this as well is is how yeah. can, how easy it is to talk about some very complicated stuff when people might be coming in with very little knowledge at all yeah yeah it, it, it's a really crucial thing and i know some i'm very cautious in all of this of kind of yeah ra raising you know, like like any old idiot can right raise a load of questions and not have any good answers on how we how we move forward but no i, I think part of it is as i kind of i suppose alluded to at the start I, it's not about adding more interpretation you know, we already have an issue with the amount of museum panels and text people will read and it's not always an awful lot at all which i think is why it's about or it should be more about how we integrate it into displays i think like a lot of i suppose a lot of approaches to museum display it's i suppose i've always kind of said as a curator it's the, the biggest achievement is somebody walks into your gallery it's not necessarily that they've walked out of it remembering every fact it's not that they've walked out of it remembering dates or remembering the names of every deity or tribe or whatever it is it's if they've walked out of it and the next day they're still thinking over something that you've implanted in their mind that you've sparked some question or got them to challenge something that they hadn't thought about before and i think that's why it's important that we start reconfiguring how religion is integrated that people don't just see there is a case of religious material that they can either engage with or walk away from it's that they keep seeing these concepts of spirituality and religious belief yeah. popping up everywhere and perhaps that that makes them question that this was something maybe that operated differently to the way they may perceive their own religion or, or a modern monotheism working i think that's how we perhaps get to it and maybe even approaching like, like things like the amulets and things that breaking this idea that religion has to be very formal and very po-faced and you know very church slash temple based that it's it's a lot more human than that and i think if we can maybe start to engage with the idea that yes somebody wearing one of these amulets is not even though some of the, the supernatural beings or powers being evoked might be different but it's not necessarily that different to somebody having a, a lucky penny in their pocket or you know trying to find those those kind of more human connections between how people work and maybe mm. that's the way we try and break down those barriers and get people to think differently yeah maybe that's, that's the way so I've got a, another quick question about, about the museum side of it. How how much um, how much do museums kind of li liaise with each other, communicate with each other to actually? Is there a sense that all the curators on the wall and in the northern zone are, are they singing from the same hymn book? Are they actually being strategic about what they show, or is it all a bit more ad hoc than that? On, on the wall, it's actually a lot better than it is in a lot of places. Um, generally across the country, yeah, no nowhere near as much as they should be. Um, Museum curators do talk to each other, but it's generally more about kind of you know professional standards and professional practice. When it comes to display and interpretation, museums are very much their own island. You know, we have our collections and we display our collections, sadly. Um, it's not necessarily the way it should be, but it, that is very much traditionally the way it's approached. Each museum is its own institution. Um, the wall is slightly different to that. And actually, and I'm really pleased to say it because there's things like the wall cap project that's I'm sure people will know about going on. Um, you know, I know that the curators at the various museums along the wall, from you know, Tully House, Historic England, Great North Museum, do meet up a couple of times a year. So, you know, so do have a greater communication. They have a greater perhaps identity as being you know, museums with wall material than some other museums do. Um, I know there are concepts at the minute as part of the wall cap project that particularly Tully House and Great North Museum have display ambitions for the future that there is more communication going on 
that they are trying to make sure that they are and maybe it's more about looking at different areas to make sure they don't overlap as much as it is you know making sure that they sync well but there's maybe two sides to that coin um so yeah and if that helps you yeah generally not as much as, as museums should do at all but but in the wall it's better than better than most <laughs> Okay, we're going to finish off with 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 two. Um, I've got two two kind of related questions about 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 the eyes. Actually, the eyes on the uh, uh, both Antonychus and and that last image you showed us with uh, the polychrome polychrome recreation. Uh, one one question about how 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 certain are we that there's that sense of the eyes being something which are that that kind of direct collect that direct, direct relationship I mean, that that's that kind of hindu idea of puja as well isn't it that that and, and darshan that direct darshan, experience yes, yeah that, that direct experience with 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 the god but also um chelsea hello chelsea if you are, if you are the chelsea who i think you are um uh, asking about that she'd been working on on some of this material and suggest and there'd been a connection with this kind of puffiness of eyes as depicted in a puffy way uh, and connected with kind of um with depictions of death uh, as well so that might be another way of thinking about kind of thinking yeah about I, haven't, I haven't come across that specifically but yeah i'm I'm really interested by that idea um but there, there is clearly something about yeah eyes and depictions of eyes or something that it, it can't be that native sculptors weren't able to to portray eyes smaller or, or more differently than they do there, there's clearly a significance there's something yeah in the, in the artistic repertoire that's meaning that they're focusing on certain body parts that yeah that, yeah they're being enlarged not because of a, yeah, an attempt at realism but because to trying to you know kind of um, exaggerate that feature for other symbolic meanings um but obviously yeah getting to exactly what that is 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 the more difficult question um but yeah, was my, my point of raising it with the Durham example is yeah, just yeah. kind of ignoring it entirely is, is obviously not the way to uh, to deal with it. <laughs> I think I think there's a sense that we always try and judge, you know, what people call kind of a bit disparagingly provincial sculpture. Mm. We always want it to be classical and like proper for and and when it doesn't live up to that, it's always seen as failure or inability to do that. Whereas actually, I think a lot of, you're right. A lot of this is about deliberate decisions to do something different. And yeah. it's not just that it's not just they can't do hands or can't do eyes. It's actually that is clearly deliberate. Uh, and I mean, I'd love to see a polychrome version of that with the eyes. Actually, with the eyes in, yeah. How like we do that? A manga character, wouldn't it? If it was these huge yeah. eyes. <laughs> the huge eyes. Uh, so but yes, yeah, some of that work I mentioned with Philip Kearn, and yes, yeah, some of his theory on that is that a lot of the stone techniques being used by native craftsmen were actually translating woodworking techniques to stone. And that perhaps some of it comes from just working in traditional techniques in a new material and how that maybe translates across that's really well. interesting. i'll have to ask you for that reference later on. yeah <laughs> I, I need to need to go away and read and there's this one final quick quick question before before we draw a line under it for today uh it's a question from liz about um is there any will to regroup the wall collection so we could have the house of mithraeum in one place so it makes more sense or even a, a wall brand to provide continuity I know trying to herd, get museums to work together is like herding cats. But yeah, and I mean, when, but maybe, maybe obviously with the Housesteads and the Clayton Museum both being Historic England collections, that there's a perhaps a single dispersed collection there. Um, it, it's one of the problems with museum collections. It, this, as I say, this idea of museums being an island, their collections, you know, once an item has been accessioned into the museum collection, it, you know, it is this status of you know it, it's here and it's here to stay which is not a bad thing in some ways but it does it does often mean that things become a little bit fixed and they become a bit entrenched and there's perhaps times when we do need to just step back and say well actually what is the best way to approach this and even the the, the loaning of objects is something that needs to happen a lot more yeah. than it than it does i think also now with the ability to make kind of copies of things I think there's, there's other ways of bringing stuff together beyond just the originals. You know, bringing. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought having those, having though the the having you know the uh, the Mithraic stuff at Karabrov and the um, uh, the, the Jupiter Dolicanus altar replicas back out on site. That's really interesting ways of kind of bringing it all together. But I, I know from personal, yeah. you know, I, I can remember visiting the Museum of Antiquities in Newcastle when I was seven or eight and going to the Mithraic display there, and I still remember the the darkness and, and 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 the whole experience of being in that in that reconstruction yeah you know, I, I did, remember that. yeah I, I didn't bring that up but i imagine that's something that people will have memories of and it's yeah it, it's a, it's a shame that that had to be removed in, yeah. in some ways um 
because I think yeah, it, it wasn't perfect, <laughs> but it at least was a more encompassing, more experiential approach, yeah, to being inside that religious space that the the current displays and the other you know, light airy museum space and the video display don't yeah don't don't capture in the same way. Well, that's wonderful. So we'll, we'll, we'll draw a line there. I'd just like to thank Anthony once again for a, a really interesting talk. And I think that the, the kind of questions we're getting show how how people have been interested in this and how it gets us to think about, you know, hopefully now when you all go around a museum display, you'll be a little bit more kind of critical about critical. What, they're trying, what they're trying to do. <laughs> critical in a constructive way. Yeah. So. Curators hate museums. Um, you should come to this. Museum curators hate museums. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you can really, 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 get, really get stuck in, write them letters, I love that. Um, <laughs> next week we have, uh, we're carrying on with religion and religion, um, particularly stone. And we're going to be having uh, Christina Cowart Smith, who's one of our PhD students from Durham, uh, talking about Anglo Saxon high crosses, early, early medieval high crosses in particular. So uh, there's a whole other world, a whole other world about how those are displayed, which we probably might go into next week as well. Otherwise, just thank you very much for, for all giving up your giving up your Wednesday evening. So next week will be the last. The Christina's will be the last as a current series, but we'll have a we'll be getting a, a new set of um, lectures is up sorted sorted shortly as i said we also have the holy wells digital project coming up rapidly soon you'll be hearing from me and finally just one quick thing before everyone goes now most of you were able to find today's link from the email i sent around i know some people didn't um so just be just just to confirm every week i will be sending a new link round so if you don't receive a link um email me directly it may be that it's got stuck in your spam folder or something but every week i will be sending a new link and i need to investigate why some of those emails i sent around uh, didn't seem to make it to everybody but if you if you've got any doubt uh, just email me i'm you can google me very easily uh only, i'm the only david pet star university and i'll be able to send you the zoom link so if it doesn't if the main if the main email doesn't hit, find you reach out to me and i'll get it to you somehow Okay, otherwise, I'll end it there. Thank you very much, Anthony, and I'll see you all. Thank soon. you all. Thank you all for the lovely comments in the, in the, in the chat as well. <laughs> Thank you all for coming along. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.